Hello and welcome to Talking Europe. One of the EU's key themes is investment in young people, in innovators and in researchers. This is considered to be essential to boosting Europe's competitiveness and to becoming a world leader in a new digital age. My guest is in charge of implementing this agenda at the European Commission. Ilyana Ivanova is the Commissioner for Innovation, Research, Culture, Education and Youth. She's a Bulgarian economist by training, and she was a member of the European Court of Auditors and a member of the European Parliament. She was appointed to her job in the EU Commission in September 2023. She joins me from Brussels. Uh, Commissioner, thank you so much for being my guest on this programme. Uh, let's start with the EU's research programme, Horizon Europe. Uh, We've just heard that it will have its budget cut. So it has a 95.5 billion euro budget. It's going to lose 2.1 billion euros. Uh, what's your reaction to that? And can the EU afford such a cut when it's trying to compete with the likes of China? This is correct. Unfortunately, I have to confirm that we have to redeploy 2.1 billion euros from the Horizon Europe program. On the other hand, I'm happy that the negotiations concluded successfully because uh, there are bigger things at stake with this uh, MFF review negotiation. But uh, I cannot be happy that uh, we are reducing the most important investment for the future, which is research and innovation, as you mentioned yourself. And it is strategically important to invest in these new technologies now, also in our uh, education, in preparing the ground for a better future and boosting our competitiveness through increasing the productivity exactly via uh, these investments in research and education. Uh, yeah, so and you, you're you... right, uh, 95.5 billion is a big number, but uh, when you spread it along the years, uh, it is actually not that much compared to our other competitors. Uh, and of course, uh, you yourself highlighted the the what you call the severe underfunding of uh, Horizon Europe's predecessor, Horizon 2020. So now there's a cut on top of the previous underfunding. I mean, this is a serious blow to the EU's uh, research program, isn't it, overall? I wouldn't call it a blow, but uh, I would call it a, a red flag because uh, we know that now we are in the midst of the preparations for the next framework program. We have a high level group set up. We have just issued the assessment of the previous program. So we're really looking at what could be done better for the future and how we could prepare for the next framework program to really start, so to say, hit the ground running with the good and important investment that should support research and innovation. So the momentum for the next program is ongoing, but it is very important to draw the attention that we badly need to increase first the effectiveness and efficiency of the spending, of the current spending, and the support in budgetary financial terms for the next frame pro pro program. I think that is crucial and very important point to make, of course, at, at uh, Brussels levels, but also in all my discussions with the ministers, especially the finance ministers, I, I hope it's realized soon that this is a strategically important investment to do. And if we look at research and innovation over the last several years, uh, there's actually been some positive development since 2016. According to the European Innovation Scoreboard, there's been an 8.3% uh, increase in innovation performance in the EU. But according to the same scoreboard, we see quite a significant innovation divide within the EU itself. That is true. That is one of the shortcomings that were identified uh, from the Horizon 2020 ex post evaluation that we still have work to do to reduce the gap between the widening countries and the excellence part of, of Horizon Europe. But a lot also has been done. The success rate has increased uh, quite substantially due to all the widening measures that have been implemented so far. We have to do more, though, to increase this access to excellence. That's how I call it, because it is important that there is equal opportunities in all regions within yeah. uh, the European Union to have 
timely, relevant and simultaneous access to that uh, information. Do you think there's also something of a north-south divide when it comes to education, not only innovation, but if we look at the last OECD figures for the top performing European countries in education, actually most of the top 15 are in northern Europe. So again, we have that, that divide within the EU, don't we? I wouldn't call it a north-south divide. Actually, I'm equally worried for the whole Europe if we speak about education and the level of basic skills, because if you look at the latest PISA results, you would actually see that there is no improvement in any member state. I was recently in Sweden and uh, uh, we've discussed that even there they are worried that uh, the level of uh, reading, writing skills, uh, mathematics, uh, comprehension is, is quite worrying uh, all, all, all across the continent. So this is something I'm, I'm very concerned about. And we are obviously at European level having limited competence, but working very, very hard with the member states to address that issue. In relation to that, I would uh, also link uh, the importance of the teachers and the teacher's profession, because they are the ones who actually are every day with, with these young children and are trying to uh, and doing their best uh, to, to improve the situation. So a plenty of measures at European level to help that, together, yeah, and, of course, with the member states. Yeah, and obviously making the educational profession attractive is, is a key part of all of this. Um, Commissioner Ivanova, I, I'd like to come on to one other area uh, that you, is part of your portfolio, which is increasing people's awareness of disinformation from an early age. How do you do that? And uh, what's the importance of, of that work when we have this uh, big European election coming up? Thank you for that question, because it is extremely important to address it. It was referred uh, recently by, by many experts as one of the most serious short-term challenges that we face. And I cannot agree more with that, because especially in this election year, it is crucial, especially for the youth. And I would say it should start from a very early age. It should start from the family. With us as parents, it is our responsibility to educate our children, to give them the tools to make the difference between good and bad. And then, of course, the role of the school and education is essential here. That's why, again, I would mention the teachers. And here we are providing a number of uh, instruments to help them to build the necessary knowledge because, you know, in the world of disinformation, things are evolving very, very fast and fake news are spreading with much more innovative methods daily. Yeah. So they need to have that uh, constant training uh, that we are providing, also updating the school curricular to be able to improve the digital literacy of, of the young kids. Mm. Yeah, that's obviously an important part of your work. You're going to be in London shortly to launch an association agreement between the EU and the UK. What is the significance of that? That is correct. Uh, the protocol for the association was signed on the 4th of December last year. And in the coming days, I'm going to London to officially launch the association of, of uh, the UK to Horizon Europe. I'm very happy because I think it's a renaissance in our relationship. And what a best uh, way to do that through uh, the largest public funding program in the world, Horizon Europe for Research and Innovation. I'm very happy that we are reviving that relationship, looking forward to real win-win for both sides because uh, we know the many success stories that have been throughout the years with that cooperation. I'm also visiting Scotland, uh, the University of Edinburgh, so really looking forward to giving, uh, so to say, a boost to that revived relationship. So concretely, what do you think this is going to give uh, British uh, scientists, for example, and researchers that they don't have access to right now? 
Well, you know better than me that the challenges that we face are quite big in uh, the area of uh, health care, climate change, deep tech, uh, and only together we can tackle those. So I firmly believe and uh, the success stories that I'm referring to from the past are a testament that this is a win-win for both sides, not only for the European researchers, but also for the British researchers, because the access that they will have through Horizon Europe program only uh, the, the latest figure from Horizon 2020 shows that 177 countries have been participating in Horizon Europe. I cannot think of another program in the world that is so open and, and so um, offering opportunities for researchers in the world. And beyond Horizon, are there any other areas where you'd like to see more cooperation, perhaps a more alignment even between the UK and the EU? Of course, we are open. You know that uh, they were also uh, part of Erasmus+. Plus. For the moment, uh, there isn't such indication, but uh, this program is also open. So all the programs that uh, there is a willingness uh, from both sides to be reopened, so to say, uh, are available. Thank you so much for uh, being on the program, Commissioner Iliana. Ivanova in charge of innovation, research, culture, education and youth. Uh, that's all for part one of Talking Europe, but we'll be back after a short break, so do stay with us.